Welcome back to Production Music Demystified with Media Tracks Music, a microcast of Music Works. On today's episode, we have a very special guest. Ella Jarman Pinto is here today to talk to us about writing to commission in a production music context. And before, here is an advert from our sponsor. Music Works is sponsored by the Musicians' Union. I'm a member of the Musicians' Union. It's the trade union for musicians living and or working in the UK and it's a community of 32,000 members working to protect musicians' rights and campaigning for a fairer industry. As well as campaigning to fix streaming and keep musicians working in the EU post-Brexit, the union collectively bargains for musicians working in orchestras and theatres and sets minimum recommended rates for freelance musicians working in other sectors. Its expert staff provide contract advice, legal advice and assistance, and a range of benefits and services to help musicians in every aspect of their work. Be part of something bigger and get the recognition you deserve. Join now at the mu.org. Welcome, Ella. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always lovely to be here. Yeah, <laughs> I have the best back. time talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I'm so looking forward to doing this. So this is a part of our Demystifying Production Music microcast series. Um, and Ella Jarman Pinto is here today to talk to us about writing to commission um, in a in a production music context. Um, so, Ella, without further ado, would you like to um, tell us what that means? <laughs> yeah. So, um, what I'm talking about is very specifically writing to commission, where you are writing the music from scratch. So, not necessarily using sample libraries, although those can come in. Um, as kind of, I, I do sometimes use sample libraries as like soundscapes, but actually what I'm talking about is like writing the notes, writing that down, um, whether it's using notation or still on logic, but um, rather than kind of uh, working with different sample libraries, that's my focus. Okay, so that's what this, this microcast episode is about yeah. today. Um, and so we've talked about this a little bit prior to this call and we're going to just leap straight in there with what makes a commissioning um, relationship good and important. And we, we talked about um, the relationship um, between the, um, the commissioner and the composer and the other people working on the project. Mm. Um, just to put this in context with the rest of the, a lot of the rest of this series is gonna be about writing music for, for libraries or for sync that's sort of subsequently picked up after it's been written. So this is quite a, a bespoke topic to this episode, I think. Mm. I mean, the, the thing I would say is the most important thing is the relationship because yeah you're being brought in as an expert to create something that essentially is um, as visible as the final visual product. So, you know, you, you essentially, if you are, you know, if you are pairing music with visuals, the visuals will have had so much going into it, but actually a lot of that is subtle. It's all about the nuance and it's things that the audience, if you took it away, the audience would notice that it's not there, but if, but without taking it away and putting it back in, the audience might not necessarily know all of the work that's gone into it. So, whereas the music very often is, is commissioned last, it's brought in last, it's done, you know, when everything else is pretty much finished. So it seems like it's the last thing and the least important thing. Um, often that can be the case, you know, it's it's got the dregs of the budget, it's got, you know, because everything mm -hmm. else has had to had to be done um so actually that but in in contrast to how it feels to put it all together the music actually is there right there with the visuals so it is extremely important and it is extremely important to get it right and often you have a short amount of time to get it right so um where i'm trying to get to is it's something where if the relationship doesn't work and the understanding of what the music brings to the production isn't necessarily there or doesn't really work, then it could be a very uncomfortable experience for pretty much everyone involved. However, when it does work, when the relationship is there, when the composer trusts themselves enough that then the director trusts the composer, 
um, and the communication flows really freely and there is this uh, universal respect as to what each person in the team brings to the table, it can absolutely be magic. It can be absolute magic. Um, so that for me is the most important thing because as a composer you are creating from what you have inside. You are creating from the emotions that you have inside. And if things are uncomfortable, then it does affect the music. Even if it still works in the end, it does affect the music. <clears throat> Absolutely. As anyone who works in a creative <clears throat> process knows, discomfort during that process always has an impact. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about an example of, um, of a communication relationship that you've had. To, it sounds to feel like a job interview. Yeah. <laughs> tell us about an example of your communication. No, I know that you have had some really, you've done some work with some, some collaborators where you've gone from a potentially quite sticky, not particularly trusting situation into really, really changing that and really bringing something, um, you know, really, really changing that viewpoint on that. So I'd, I'd love mm. for, for our listeners to hear about that. Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, can, are we, we're still bringing up the fact that I wrote for your podcast. And yeah, was... yeah. <laughs> Anyone who was wondering where our amazing podcast jingle comes from. <laughs> the work so, of the drama Pinto. Uh, <laughs> and like, so this is, this is, I think this is a really interesting um, one because you and I, we knew each other pretty well by that point. I think we'd been working together for a year or so and we knew each other pretty well and still it was slightly sticky. It was a bit of a sticky, <laughs> sticky interaction because suddenly we were in a different, uh, in a different mode. You know, I was like, I have to provide something for you in the time frame that I've got that you will ultimately like. And you were like, I've got to trust her to do it and to pull it off. And I don't know what I like. And, and I don't currently like what she said to me. <laughs> and, and, you know, and the thing is, is that <clears throat> this is always going to happen, which is why I wanted to bring up our example of, of me writing for you, is that it's always going to happen because I am never going to get it right first time. I am very open and very honest about never going to get it right first time. And if I do, I don't know what went wrong. Because, <laughs> the, you know, w when I start writing, I'm starting ideas and it doesn't, it's not going to be perfect, but I'm just trying to, you know, when they say, just trying to get the flow, you know, when they say like, it's dreadful to have a blank first page. So just trying to get the flow, just trying to get the flow, 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 flow. But also I do want to send you what I'm doing, because for me, you as the commissioner being part of the process is so important. Because the worst thing for me is me being like, I don't want to send it to you until it's perfect. Then I send it to you. I fall in love with it. You hate it. And now I have to start again. <clears throat> Whereas if I send it to you and you go, oh, a little bit more of that. Oh, a little bit more of that. A little bit less of that. A little bit more of that. You know, that's, that's where I can kind of be guided on my creative train. Where I can kind of take in what you're saying without fear that I'm going to get stuck having to start again. Or... Or I can kind of, I was going to use the word manipulate, that's not what I'm trying to say. But you know, there are times when you say, I'm not sure about that. It's like, okay, I will turn the volume down. What do you think about it now? Oh, I quite like it now. You know, it's going to be the really subtlest changes. Um, and so that's why it's, it's so important to kind of have that relationship. And the main thing that I find where all of the issues come from is when someone says, I don't really want to upset her. I don't mm. want to say I don't like it because I don't want to upset her. And I'm like, I just need you to tell me you don't like it. <laughs> just need you to tell me that. <laughs> really interesting, yeah, just isn't tell it? Me. <laughs> Obviously and I completely understand. Yeah, of course. <laughs> like, but no, absolutely right. And um, and it's interesting actually this example because I can give my perspective as a commissioner. Mm. And obviously, I I I came into this with a very a, a lot of like pre-approval in terms of like obviously I knew that I wanted the music to come from you and I trusted you completely, mm. um, which isn't always the case at the beginning of a of a commissioning relationship. And I also valued the work that was going to go into it. I knew how long it was going to take. Um, which I think is interesting in itself. The fact that this we're talking about a 10, 11 second piece of music here. And I even, think it took less than that. Yeah. Yeah. And it took what do we think it took about three full days to create that? Uh, I probably panicked about it more than that. 
think yeah. probably you, the external that you that you experienced was three full days. Yeah. <laughs> I probably spent a couple of weeks thinking and panicking about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Eleven seconds of music. And yeah. um just for just for anyone wondering <laughs> like why someone can't just chuck out a piece of music like that. There's yeah. that's why. Um <laughs> but also um I wanted to be like a good commissioner and so I wanted to give really good feedback and so for me and this might not be the the, there are other examples of how this could work to do with people perhaps having less prior understanding or less prior value of um, create the creating of music and that process but for me uh, my problem was that I I didn't know what I wanted it to sound like which you very reassuringly told me was a good thing because that's your job and that was a really interesting conversation that we had as well, because I was like, oh, I hate it when people say like, oh, t- send me some examples of things that you like. And I'm like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but we really went through this process together. Once we got over, once once the message hit about having to tell you that I don't like it. And actually the most hilarious thing happened. It wasn't, neither of us actually solved this problem. I feel like it was your husband that actually solved this problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. I just remembered as I was talking about it now. It was, yeah, you, do you want to, you tell the story? No, you, you tell it. Oh goodness, <laughs> I can't, I can't remember it. But it, it was something like, I put something together and I thought, I'm really happy with this. I really like this. And I sent it to you and I took it home and I, I showed it to my husband and I can't remember exactly what it, he was, it, but it was like, Ella, that sounds like a fucking thriller. Yeah, I think the exact words were spooky as fuck. Yeah, Ella, that's spooky as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you're like, oh my god, I've just totally ruined this, I'm so sorry. Like, I because just, I, you, what was happening with me was I was like, okay, not what I was expecting. <laughs> like, listening to it a few times, like, not really, you hadn't heard from me because I was listening to it, trying to get into your head and be like, is it, you know, this is what she sees this podcast as being like. And then I got that email and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and then Cause, like <laughs> yeah because sometimes i do get too close sometimes yeah i get too close to it and i do need that perspective of no no yeah and i think <laughs> i was too close to it as well because i was so like pre- i was very prepared for you to give me like the musical representation of all of the stuff that we talked about about the podcast and what it meant and what it was for um and then and also i mean the the upshot of this story which i feel like we could recount for ages is that we really we then really did go into this process of talking we literally discussed i mean i can't even remember we must have pinged back and forth tens of clips um that were some of them which were almost identical but very subtly different Mm -hmm. and then at the end you put this that you were like oh so i've just put this thing at the end that was completely different from what we were actually talking about Mm -hmm. and i just went oh that's what it is and it was completely different from what I'd had in mind. I'd had in mind something quite motivational, quite kind of like, oh, we're going to, you know, have a really good kind of energy filled chat. And then you just put this fairly calm, inquisitive, <laughs> like little, <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, so that's the thing, you know, that's the thing yeah. is that, you know, we might have a starting point. So it's probably also useful to sort of talk about the starting point and how I actually bring in people's vision, you know, my clients' visions, um, Mm. in that the starting point is, for me, talking. It is talking. And and, and I think this process is very different from lots of different people. But for me, it is talking to the commissioner. It is saying, how do you feel about this? What are you looking forward to? What are you worried about? What do you want to get out of it? What are your fears? What do you not want it to be? What would you um, like it to mean for someone in six months time? What would you like it to mean for you in three years time? You know, people are going, what is this about the music? Like, this, what has it got anything to do with the music? Um, And sometimes I say, what color do you think of? Do you have a certain color in your head? And when you, when you're thinking about your, either about the work or when you're thinking about the music, do you have a certain feeling? Do you, where do you feel it in your body? You know, these things that might not mean anything to anybody, but for me, the more I think about it, the more it kind of just morphs into music, the more I'm like, okay, I've got shapes, I've got ideas, I've got textures, I've got thoughts, I've got a focus. It's a, um, 
it's a way of kind of focusing from I could do all these things to ah this is this is where I think I could go with this and then I start from there and it might not actually come out from that at all it might not in any way finish up how I thought it would start and I have to be open to that for myself um, and so that's why it's like I really want to bring the client on the journey because if I promise something and then I can't do it that that's then not managing the client's expectations but if I'm saying to the client <clears throat> come with me on my journey come with me as we are um, you know as I'm processing this music come and influence me more you know you're you're trusting me and you're trusting my expertise that I can create something that has your essence in it and has your vision in it but I need you <laughs> To be involved in that, otherwise it won't. You know. Well, I think and this is this is the real crux, isn't it, of writing to commission, especially for for production music, is that it has a lot of pre existing stuff. It has yeah. probably it has a story, it has a message, it has vision, it has a the director track. that yeah, well, it has a apps, yeah, <laughs> that too. Um, so it's not your own single-handed creative vision it is a collaboration and the and all the best collaborations come from the closest possible meeting of minds and understanding mm -hmm. and the bringing of each person's absolute area of specialness together yes. to create something that's bigger than any one of you yes and i feel that um <clears throat> You know, I'm aware I've not got into technical things about how to actually write the music because I think every composer has their own way of doing it. And um, but it, it is this thing of, you know, for so often in order to get the job, composers rely on tropes. You know, we, we, we like, oh, that's what a horror film sounds like. Sorry, I've got flies in my room. That's what a horror <laughs> film sounds like. That's what a love film sounds like. This is the kind of music that you play under here. This is what you do for that. And actually, <clears throat> You know, tropes and cliches come from a moment of genius. Oh, I don't, I don't like the word genius. Come from a moment of creative explosion and creative expression and mm. come from a place where someone has been allowed to do what, what makes them do what they need to do. You know, like allowed to be themselves and allowed to really creatively move. And when, certainly when clients get stuck on trying to have those those tropes in their music, they, they, they really lose out on something and they really, um, I feel like they miss an opportunity. Um, and so I think it's something, it's a job for the composers to, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what I hear is, you know, composers need to know their place and, you know, they're not very important and, well, you know, a director is queen. Um, you know, director is is most important person, and actually, it's not that at all. If you're thinking in hierarchical format, if you're thinking about these hierarchies, you're not going to allow people to express. Yes, you need leadership within mm. the collaboration, but I think the composer needs to show that leadership too, and needs to say, this is the way you will get the best from me. This is how I work, and if that's not, the way that you work, am I the best composer for your job? Absolutely. And this is something I'm still, you know, I think I think everyone has to find their way and we will make mistakes and I'm still working this out. So this is this is all idealistic. I'm still working it out. But I always will be. Um, because every collaboration is different. Every interaction is different. But the most important thing is to hold on to this idea that you as a composer have been hired because you are deemed as an expert, if you weren't there, they would have to hire someone else. They're not going to write their own music. So you have to stay in your kind of power. You have to stay in your, your knowledge of what you can bring to the table. And then your job is to communicate that and enable the person you're working with to communicate you in the best way that you need in order to get the music that they need. That's a very roundabout way of saying, I think. I'm hoping. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, yeah. There, there's something that you said. I'm just having a huge like takeaway from this as well, which um, I love what you said about um, the tropes or cliches actually re totally reframing those as a moment of someone else's um, creative explosion that has been so impactful that it's actually defined genres. Yes. And that is a very, very different way of looking at it from 
the kind of traditional approach to library music for production, which is that you create something that sounds a certain way and then hopefully it gets picked up yeah. for um, use on those certain things. And now I'm just thinking about our um, collaborators on this podcast, Media Tracks, who um, are a production music label um, recently shifted to that from being a production music library, a subtle shift in many ways, but um, they are really focusing on the people behind the music and the creation of, of music with live instruments and live people making it and um, focusing on the, the composers and the writers of the music. And I think the um, obviously it's very much within their stable to be producing albums of, for instance, music for horror or music for romantic scenes and so on and so forth. And I just think it's an absolutely wonderful reframe to be thinking of these albums um, that have been created by human beings in moments of genius that's going to really lift up a piece of um, film or TV or media um, in in this way. So, yeah. yeah. And, and I think we can, uh, we as composers can get stuck. I see this everywhere, you know, can get stuck thinking, oh, you've got this genius here. I'm going to use John Williams as, a, an ex as an example of people holding him up on a pedestal. And I'm in no way saying he's a bad composer. He's brilliant. <laughs> he's absolutely brilliant. But, you know, like, he's the, ma he's the maestro. He's, like, the best person. He, you know, I can never write like him. You know, he's, he's the pinnacle of who I want to be. And I'm like, no, I don't want to be like him. I want to be me. And I want to mm -hmm. work in collaborations that allow me to be me in the way that he worked in collaborations that allowed him to be him. That's what I want. Yeah, and that's, that's, what it, that's, what, that's what it's about. And if we put people up on pedestals, then we actually lessen ourselves and lessen our, what we can bring to the table. And it goes the other way as well. I mean, it's for every, that, that, that advice is for everybody. Um, and, and as part of that, I kind of like to bring up red flags as well. Yeah. This is something also, you know, um, I recently contributed to an article uh, at The Hollywood Reporter about me too movement having missed um composers female composers um and how there is real horrific abuse in the composer industry essentially um and how there's no real support there's no certainly in the us there's no unionization we have the mu in the uk but again they're doing incredible work but again it's it's all it's all new <laughs> it's this is mm. all new um and so you know, there is something about holding on to something of yourself rather than trying to spend all night doing, you know, uh, spend all night kind of doing revisions and revisions and revisions because someone said jump, so you jump because you want the work, you want to be hired again. But actually, you are a human being. You are a human being. And um, anything that makes you feel that you are not being respected uh, anything that makes you feel that your time is not respected or that your work is not respected or you feel that communication is off, it's really worth either bringing that up with your client and seeing the response to it or bringing it up with yourself and seeing like, is this what I want to be doing in my life? Do I actually want to be spending the rest of my life doing nights, jumping when someone says this because they haven't thought about the music soon enough or they're not communicating with you in time? You know, you as, as composers, we are our own boss, unless you're in a job. Um, but often, you know, we are our own boss. We often work in a way that means that, you know, certainly for me, I don't do well in PAYE jobs. I don't like having a boss. I like being my own boss. Um, and that means that you also then have to really look after yourself. We don't have line managers. We don't have any of that sort of HR department. We are our own HR department. So we have to decide, is this the right project for me? Am I going to work with this person? And certainly any kind of toxic abuse or anything, just get out of there. You do not deserve mm. to be treated in that way. You absolutely deserve to be on projects that treat you with respect and that honour your time and uh, who communicate clearly. You really deserve that. And that also will help with the music. Absolutely. We're all humans and experts in our own music and our own process and I think this in, in particular an early career it can feel like we can bend on that in order to take advantage of opportunities or you know be grateful for opportunities and I mean you know that I agree with you about this that this just perpetuates the myth that there's sort of 
debts to be paid or dues to be paid the, yes. on, on entry to the in- industry, oh which goodness. is... Um... Yeah, <laughs> this, this whole thing of like, I'm in debt, I've been given this for free and it's an amazing opportunity and I have to do everything I can. You know, so I'm working for free and I'm doing everything I can to get this done because what an amazing opportunity. They could have given it to someone else. Bullshit. Absolute bullshit. No. <laughs> you will get paid work. You will get paid work, no matter how you manage to do it. You will get paid work and you do not owe anyone a thing. No. You have got to where you are because you've studied or because you've practiced or because it's just who you are. Do not owe anyone a thing. (laughs) No. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, there you go. We asked for an episode on commissioning and we've got one. Uh, thank you so much Ella it's a real pleasure as always to talk to you about this Um, yeah thank you so much and have a great day Bye. bye